soup. What if I got no? I already, I already have it planned out. What I'm gonna do if I like get rich or win the lottery? I thought you were gonna say die trying. <laughs> I know who's getting what. <laughs> it is funny. I do that too. Where I'm like, oh, if it's three hundred, yeah, what's a couple million here? A couple million right. there. Depends on how much, but I'll treat you good. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I wasn't thinking for me. I was more thinking for Teddy because he would probably take a hit out on you. Well, if I win the lottery, like this is over. <laughs> No, I probably would actually still do the podcast because you need something to do before you go crazy, right? That's what they say. You know, they get, people get bored when they're rich. Why don't be- you become like a big, big shot investor? You know, <sighs> you tour the world, look for people's ideas. You know, just a traveling Shark Tank. I feel like I don't have any ambition. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to talk about the Oscars. Play the music. We have a full live orchestra here. You're supposed to do, I don't know, music yeah, I no, know you're on your like, phone, something. And I am joined here today with Aaron the Nerd Soup Monkey. Yeah, keep going, right? Don't play me off. A little background elevator music. I am Bo Oliver, and uh, yeah, you can listen to the Nerd Soup Podcast on all the places where we publish our podcasts and here on YouTube. And as you see from the title, we're going to be recapping the 2023, thank God you stopped, Oscars. We're going to be talking all the winners, the show, what we thought about the production, the surprises, the twists, what everybody's complaining about because that's always fun the week after the oscars and you can follow us on social media at nerd soup at bow soup at nerd soup monkey on most platforms if you're on a social media just type those letters and names in you might be surprised depending on where you are on social media but yeah i'm excited well you know what to tell you the truth i'm not excited but i'm just excited to record a podcast not specifically about the oscars because if like- we didn't do a podcast <laughs> yeah just like you <laughs> yeah yeah right if we didn't do a podcast, I wouldn't be watching this show anymore. <laughs> but you know what? It was what you said. You were like, somebody's, one of us has to watch the show. I had a playoff hockey game that night that I missed. Wow, really? Yeah, we won. We had a back-to-back, and I scored the game-winning goal on Monday, so I think I needed the rest. <laughs> That's so funny. You're Anthony Davis of your hockey team? <laughs> they can't play you for back-to-backs? <laughs> no, I felt bad because we had no no subs, so the guys are just out there for the whole game, and I'm just sitting on my couch eating Chinese food, drinking wine, watching the Oscars. Yeah, like, I yeah, checked guys, the group chat after, like, yeah, there were a couple of fights, as we, like, we were out mans, we still won. <laughs> hey, man, that's awesome. That was a playoff game? Yeah. Wow, look at that. Yeah, you told them you had to work. Stuff in your I face did. with Chinese. Honestly, that's low key one of like the coolest things about this is like if I really don't like I can just be like oh I have to watch a movie or I have to play a video game and I'm I, like and it's for work and I cannot and I I'm telling the truth. Technically, every movie and show that we watch is working because you can use it for a reference or a connection or talk about it. Oh yeah, no, it really is just sharpening the blade. Really, Re- yeah, that's what it is. So no, nope, can't, can't do that. I'm working. <laughs> Right, no, it's perfect for me because I'm the master of flaking with plans. Right. So my sister gets super frustrated. She's like, oh, you can make up your schedule. I'm like, no, we've got deadlines. (laughs) (laughs) The invisible hand that all YouTubers must bow down to. I had a good old time. I like war shows. I like pour some wine, sit down, relax, order some takeout. It's fun. It is fun. I enjoy watching it. I think that I need to realize, well, I do realize this. I think that we always take the approach of if we don't like a movie, we're not going to make that our entire personality shitting on this movie whenever it comes up. We say our piece and then we move on. But I think what's not supposed to happen or what I get frustrated with is the bombardment of takes that I don't agree with. And that's okay. I don't have to agree with them. But you're not supposed to experience that much disagreement within a you know, a, a few hours span. Well, I saw a lot of people shitting on, like, Austin Butler. And but it's just, it, the thing is, I don't seek out things yeah. that I disagree with. So when you're bombarded with things that you don't agree with and you think that some of them are where people are exaggerating or they take it very personally, I just don't care about that aspect of it anymore. You know, there's nobody I'm, I'm really waving the flag for anymore. I, I'm not going to be like, that's a disgrace. There's one that, like, I got mad about, but I'm already over it. But, like, for the most part, I think the thing for me, the last time I got really excited excited about something winning was like Parasite. I don't think anything, and I was really excited, and Brandon Fraser, I was really excited for that. Um, but for the most part, 
especially when you see everything like back in the day if like maybe I've watched half the movies I think I had more of a pull like oh the movie I watched and liked is nominated against these movies I never seen so I'm, I'm pulling for that one no matter what now that like you see everything and like year after year you kind of realize that the line between or the difference between two performances and two movies is kind of thin for the most part like especially the top two favorites that um and like leading up to the oscars now that we're like more plugged in you kind of see which ways the tide is going so it's kind of hard to be surprised or upset anymore there are a few but like like when ki hoi kwan won like that was the most obvious like that was 100 percent gonna happen and i love the speech and everything but then you see people being like oh yes he did it which is a great moment but it's like we kind of knew that for the past month <laughs> That, that's, right. that this was going to happen. All in all, I thought it was a solid show. I can't stand like Jimmy Kimmel. I, I actually am. I actually am a Jimmy Kimmel guy. But like, like there, there was it was just weird because one of the things they promoted and were happy about and patting themselves on the back about it's like, oh, we we listened to film lovers. We brought back all the awards. Now here's ten jokes about how long the show is, which is a direct result of including all the awards. Well, it was weird because it was a mixture of the opening montage felt like a celebration of movies, right? B roll footage behind the scenes actors goofing off directors doing the thing with their hands and i was like oh this is refreshing and then as soon as he came on screen i'm like this guy yeah. in the back of the jet with tom cruise and i thought he was he sounded a little winded in his opening monologue like he, he was desperate was for tame. someone was tame right but he, even his tone sounded nervous which is funny because he's usually such a laid-back guy his demeanor is always super chill and then he kind of calmed down after that. But yeah, I think that I would like to see it done where the comedian comes out, does their monologue, and disappears. I don't care about all the song and dance either. I want to know who won the awards. That's right. the anticipation for me. When they announce Best Animation, I'm like, okay, let's see if Puss in Boots can pull off the upset. I knew Pinocchio was going to win, but that's what I'm giddy for. I don't care about... I, I love Lady Gaga. I like Rihanna, but I checked out both of their performances. I went, went yeah, to shower and then time. went to get food. Yeah. I think, um, and sometimes, I mean, Natu Natu is just fun because it's just like uh, with the dancing and it's a, it's a, like a show. Um, so I enjoyed that. But even like the Everything Everywhere All at Once song, like that's specifically made for that movie. That doesn't translate well <laughs> to a live performance at all. Yeah. Um, and Natu Natu, it was a good performance, but it also felt like a consolation prize. Right. Even though everybody really did like it. I'm not it trying won. to be a party pooper. It did win. But that's a movie that, man, should have been in the best picture race. Oh, yeah, like the, Just for the exposure it could win, have gotten. Yeah, winning song, like that, it was their best picture or nomination or recognition, which it should have been recognized beyond that. But like overall, like in terms of like who won, I thought it was like actually a really solid show. I like the presentation of the nominees, like category specific role uh, reels that they played, like to show like the VFX. And they showed some VFX, and for cinematography, they showed behind the scenes and stuff like that. Little things like that, I really enjoyed. But yeah, best way to like trim off the show. Which is, like, I don't think they are going to do it, Dep I, I guess depending on the year, but, like, removing some of the songs and things like that. Um, but also, ABC is not going to say no to a chance to have Rihanna and Lady Gaga, because that's probably getting a lot of eyeballs on the show, too. Yeah, and there was a ratings jump. I think it was 12% from last year, but the last three years are still the lowest rated shows in Oscars history. But right. at the very least, it looks like they hit bottom and they're going back up. It could have been worse. It could have kept trending downward. So at the very least, there were more eyeballs on it. And maybe you have to factor in Rihanna and Lady Gaga for the bump. So, yeah, I, I guess it's not the best year to complain about live performers because some years it's terrible. Mm -hmm. Like the one year where they had Eminem out there doing stuff, and that was strange. I'm trying to think of other things that I liked about the present. I mean, some of the, the – another thing they can cut, does every celebrity couple need to come out and do a stupid bit? Just have them come out and read something really quick. Some of those are fun, though. Name name five that were fun. Uh, you know who I thought had great chemistry? Paul Dano and Ju Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Yeah, you want to miss that? I was like, man, get them on a rom-com or something. No, that they're either really pair. good or really bad. Yo, dude, the one with The Rock? Like, The Rock has to do something. Yeah. It was, oh, God, it's so cringy. Elizabeth Banks and Cocaine Bear was good. N I think that may have been the worst one. As much as I love Elizabeth <laughs> Banks, she's up there was dying with COVID. And the bear and the timing between them was horrible. <laughs> and then the poor bear going next to Malala. Well, that was just Jimmy Kimmel being dumb. Um, she's too good for that. But when he's like, he couldn't have done a classy joke like she's like, got a Nobel Peace Prize, more important than any Oscars. <laughs> see, yeah, that'd be f like I feel like I can write. Where's a Billy Crystal? A Jimmy Kimmel monologue. And that's <laughs> apparently not a good Judd thing. Apatow helped him. 
No, that, that was false, they said. That was false? Okay. That's why Tom Cruise didn't want to come, because he thought Judd Apatow was, well, again, it's probably fake. But. Well, as soon as I heard that Tom Cruise didn't want to come, I thought, yeah, because when they pan to his camera after somebody inevitably inevitably makes a Scientology joke, he's going to be super pissed. I mean, he had a couple stinkers. I'm surprised he didn't go with, like, a, like, and this is just what I think of, like, Jimmy Kimmel doing, like, a cheesy Oscars monologue. Um, there was a little bit, little references to Will Smith. I knew that was going to happen. Um, surprised he didn't make like a woman talking joke. That seems like low hanging fruit for him. I like the joke he made about, first of all, I don't know why he went so hard after Spielberg. (laughs) That was funny. He's like, you made a movie about your dad getting cucked. (laughs) (laughs) Essentially, that's what he said to the greatest living director, arguably. He's the king of Hollywood. Yeah. And he's just roasting him. And then he called... Uh, Seth Rogen and Spielberg, the Hunter and Joe Biden of Hollywood. That was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. But other like, than yeah, that, the Seth Rogen we joke, very easy joke to make. Very easy, yeah. Um, well, I like how he asked everybody to do a little bit before he talked about his security team, and they were like, "Oh, Andrew Garfield, can you do a web slinging?" Mm-hmm. And he just did that awkward smile. That was funny. But I, I think that when they had no host, man, that show was really just moving along. That was nice. Yeah. Uh, just give me somebody new. Or why can't... Give me a great monologue and then just move on. I don't need Kimmel coming back and back for different bits and different things. And It seems like they scaled it back this year. Some years it's too over the top. But for the most part, it was a fine presentation. Yeah. I'll I, always be so regretful that I didn't stay up for last year's show and miss the slap. Dude, I, that was insane, man. <laughs> that really was a crazy I rewatch moment. it all the time and just like... If, I'm like, I can't believe this happened. <laughs> it's like when that girl got hit with the shovel. <laughs> it's like the Hollywood equivalent. <laughs> Did you watch the Chris Rock special? I watched parts of it, and I saw when he had, he addressed it. What a shitty response. Yeah, no, it's for me, it's too late. I don't care anymore. Yeah. It's still funny for me to watch just, just because it's somebody fun. getting slapped. But no, no, it, it felt very It's like you're Chris insecure. Rock, you were like the best comedians ever, and you can't make a joke out of it, like a clever thing. It was basically just him calling him a bitch and people just like laughing for some reason. There was like no <laughs> jokes, like, and he ruined his joke because he said the wrong movie before. He gave away the punchline. Um, so whatever. But awards, any, any winners, <laughs> any, any, any losers? Well, I mean, we could just start with Best Picture. We can do the opposite, right? I mean, everybody at this point, everybody knows. Do we have to address it in order? Should we start with Best uh, Live Action Short? That was actually a, a, an upset. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. Well, no, let's just talk about everything, everywhere, all at once. The big winner from the day. It was on both of our top 20 lists of the year. I think it made both of our top fives. Where yeah, did you, you have it? 20, right? <laughs> no, I had Ambulance at 20. People uh, forget Ambulance. I think I had it. I, it was definitely top three. It was top three or four. And I feel like all those kind of muddled together. Like, my top four was pretty pick and choose. But, yeah, it was definitely up there for me. Yeah, I think, I think it was number three for me after Nope and RRR. Yeah, I had Fableman's, RRR, Everything Everywhere, I think, and The Whale. Which... Oh, look at that. Yeah, it's unfortunate that Nope got absolutely no love whatsoever. But we're not here to complain about that. Let's celebrate Everything Everywhere all at once for a little bit. I think a lot of people have pointed this out, that the improbability, the impossibility of a movie like this winning maybe even four or five years ago, it's insane. And I think Parasite did open the floodgates, even though the movies after Parasite would run contrary to that theory. But it's awesome uh, that a movie like this that was so weird, took so many different chances, where everybody's so obsessed with the idea of the multiverse, and here comes this absolute buzzsaw that takes that concept and has so much fun with it. You know, the creativity, the imagination on display was just sensational to watch. And it's one of those movies where I'll always point at it and say, this is the difference between the experience you have watching a show and watching a movie. Where a movie is just this, it feels like a 10, 12 hour experience when it's done correctly. Because you know these characters and you've walked in their shoes and multiple different iterations of their lives because of the way it's, it's told. And by the end of it, you're emotionally drained in the best possible way because it's so fulfilling. And the idea of the donut, the way it all comes together, that that hole that's inside of all of us, that thing that's missing or the thing that's uh, impossible to communicate with your family, with your friends, with the people you love. It's just a, a super therapeutic experience, but just also really fun. And that to me is the mark of a movie that's operating on so many different levels and as close to perfection as you could get when telling a story like this. Yeah, it seems like, well, we've, we've seen it over and over again, movies that are, are, movies that are very creative, 
and something new and different. Maybe they'll get some love, but never, very rarely take home the top prize and get so much love in pretty much across the board when it comes to these categories with nominations and wins. So, yeah, it was definitely good to see just the Academy actually embracing creativity and different stories and something a little weird. And like you said, when you strip it down, like it has everything that you want going into a movie and that I think even your, to your most general audience, to your biggest film snob can enjoy because it is a lot of fun, uh, but it's also hits and emotional beats that few films can. It's funny. There's great acting, great action. So it, it, really, has, it really has everything that you want going for it. And to blend all those different elements into this weird story and the creativity, the editing, all just culminating into... You know, if you really look at it from like a different standpoint of what movie is the best or what movie do you like more, and you look at it like just best picture, what encapsulates every aspect of film, it's this movie more than any other this year, I feel like. Yeah, I totally agree because, you know, these days it seems like fans, they're always more partial, partial to narrative driven stories. But with a, a movie like this, the narrative is really strong, but it's also super absurd. And the imagery is so just, I mean, it did win for best editing. And I think going into it, uh, going into the awards or going into award season, a lot of people thought that it would be the favorite for editing at the very least. And then it managed to build up this momentum. But some of the sequences, you watch them and you can't even imagine or fathom what it took to edit this in a way that makes sense. It's such a chaotic fucking movie. The fact that it visually also makes sense is a triumph. And Paul Rogers did win for best editing. and People were very horny over him. Yeah, everybody was like, oh man, the best editor is hot, <laughs> which is funny. But yeah, apparently, it's funny how we, how we think of all these technical people as just like gross. <laughs> yeah, gross nobodies. If you were good looking enough, you'd be in front of the camera. That's what it always is, right? <laughs> best director is just a failed actor. The, the idea that, you know, the process of them editing this movie has already become myth. Apparently it was a really small team and they did it on Adobe Premiere Pro during the pandemic and they turned out what is, in my opinion, one of the best edited movies that I've ever seen. And the fact that something this far out there could be awarded Hollywood's top prize, it shows that in in some ways we are moving in the right direction. Until Coda 2 wins next year. <laughs> God. Well, you know what? I really liked uh, when the actor from Coda presented, so I wouldn't mind seeing him again something. It is kind of like, I think it is kind of neat, though, thinking about it. Like, a film like Coda could win one year, and this film could win the next. Like, you know, it just shows that we're not stuck in certain genres or certain types of movies to be the ones and the favorites to win. That it really can be anything. So I think it sets a good precedent, and hopefully moving forward, we see maybe you just the implications of studios you know a24 we always talk about just how great their movies are and we saw it play out this award season where they swept all the top prizes um but other studios investing in creative and out there stories i think that's just a good thing and yeah not a24 only, didn't they win every major category yeah and not only like just to win the award but like financially it was a success um, right yeah highest grossing a24 movie it's an independent film. Right. So, so they took a chance on it and look what they delivered. We usually see movies that release and what would this what this come out in early in the year? Yeah, in March. So like for a movie from March to sustain momentum until the end of the year, it doesn't happen often. That's one thing a lot of people point to when you look at performances, Peter Nwango from us, that movie came out in February and lost momentum. That's why Get Out was such a anomaly when it came out. Another February, February release that held its momentum going into the Oscars and uh, was able to get a Best Picture nomination and a Screenplay Award. So, yeah, it, it kind of came over multiple obstacles and still was able to come out on top. Yeah, when you factor in everything that was working against it, not only that stuff, but the idea of a movie with a predominantly Asian cast being this celebrated and this awarded, because in past years, a movie like this wouldn't have even been considered. We'll give Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon Best International Feature, but we're not going to nominate it for Best Picture, even though you can argue it was probably a better movie than A Beautiful Mind. I think that's the same year. So the fact that now we're at a place where it is normal for a movie being led by an Asian-American actress to be the biggest movie of the year, maybe not financially, but 
critically and when it comes to award season. So that's a triumph in its own right. And the movie just happens to be really good. And that's the thing when we talk about diversity. It's not that we're forcing you or, or we're, we're picking these movies or we're celebrating these films because they're diverse. It's because they've always been good. There have always been movies with black casts or Hispanic casts or directed by women, directed by minorities that just weren't acknowledged. These stories have always existed. Now they're being celebrated. And sure, things have changed where they are more willing to take chances on certain types of films. But this is what we talk about when we say diversity. It's giving people the acknowledgement that they've deserved for far too long. And it's cool to see that we are at a place where a movie led by Michelle Yeoh, who's had such a long and storied career, could become this celebrated. And I think it really is a damn good movie. It's the, you know, the funny tweet or the funny review on Letterboxd that when the movie first came out was... What's happened to my buddy Eric? <laughs> probably. Got to check on Eric. Uh, enjoy this movie before film Twitter tells you that it sucks. Yeah. I can't remember who wrote that review, but it was so true because the the discourse surrounding it has become... Film and this Twitter is, is turning into sports Twitter right before my eyes, and it's so frustrating. <laughs> yeah, but, and at least with sports, there's an element of this doesn't matter. But no, no, there isn't. It's the only thing that matters. Yeah, well, at least for me, yeah. where I can be like, okay, I'm not going to take this any... I don't care, you know, how you feel about a certain player after a certain point. But there's so many people that uh, they spend such an important amount of time in their lives developing these projects. And when it gets too personal, it's like maybe... I'm not saying you shouldn't be negative, but you know, take it back a bit. Where you don't have to spend every waking moment or every moment of the show just shitting on the movies. Because I saw people getting really weird with their takes about the Daniels. And it's just like, yo, they seem like two goofy guys mm -hmm. that successfully made this project. And they seem like they've, they have they were overwhelmed by the moment. But I never thought they got too cringy or too annoying. But it, like I said, it just gets way too personal. That's why I try to operate in the place of if I liked it, I'll celebrate. If I didn't, I, I'm not going to talk about it. Because I'm not trying to be one of these internet weirdos. Seriously, go touch grass. Like, if you, some of the shit that you see about these movies, it's just weird. Yeah, a lot of times it's splitting hairs, too, or you're overblowing something just to... If you were to tell me why I like Fablemans more than everything, everywhere, all at once, it would force me to right, if put I it down to you some that. extent. Yes. But, like, at the end of the day, it's like I still love both movies. Well, that that's a good movie to bring up because everybody kept making the point, oh, now Spielberg's going to lose to the fucking Daniels. Like, <laughs> that's mean. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, Blake Bortles beat the Steelers, like, right? Didn't he? Right, no, that's yeah. a good analogy. <laughs> like, a little dis disrespectful for the Daniels, but it does happen, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. That was his Mark everything Sanchez. everywhere. <laughs> I'm not big on my Jaguars lore, but I can recite this verbatim. Mark Sanchez beat Peyton Manning and Lucas Oil, then beat Brady in Foxborough. So, it happens. No, it does happen. And I'm not saying that Daniels are Mark Sanchez. I mean, Mark Sanchez has four road playoff wins, but... Well, that's the other part of it. They they did win Best Director, so now where do they go in their careers? They've got to be the, the golden boys of Hollywood in this very moment. So I hope for their sake that whatever project they choose to focus on next is a success because you don't want them to be labeled as a, you know, one-hit wonder. That's sort of what... I'm not comparing them to the Russo brothers in terms of quality or types of films, but... You know, the Russo brothers have made stinkers since the Avengers, and now everybody's like, oh, they're good for nothing. Yeah. So you hope that whatever they choose to do next is, uh, not that it necessarily can live up to everything everywhere, but that it's good. You think and they that, break off from each other? I mean, shit, right? Like They've the whole Destiny's them. Child thing? Like, who's the Beyonce? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting way to look at it. I was thinking that, you know, look what we just accomplished. It's not getting better than this. No. Let's just go our separate ways, right? Just do other stuff. But yeah, like I said, we're going to be moving on here. We're going to talk about some of the big winners of the night and uh, some of the, the bigger upsets. I think the biggest upset for me is Jamie Lee Curtis. I still have no idea okay, we'll start how there. she was able to. like. And I guess, I don't know if they do this on purpose, but like if there was a theme for the Oscars and the voters, like giving it to people, even though Jamie Lee Curtis has been working and is iconic in her own right, but like with Brendan Fraser and Michelle Yeoh, who... They definitely deserved it. I'm not saying, I'm not lumping them together, but it seemed like the year where, like, it was kind of like not underdog story, but people who either have been slighted or haven't gotten the respect they deserve throughout the years are finally, like, this is their time to shine. And it seems like that kind of, like, especially with the acting, was like a common thread. Yeah, there was one funny tweet, picture of Brendan Fraser hold, holding his Oscar, and the caption was, Sorry for ruining your life. Here's a gold statue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was similar with 
Kehoi Kwan, and we've talked about this. But yeah, it does feel that way. I mean, a lot of people are criticizing the Jamie Lee Curtis nomination as a legacy award. It she shouldn't have. Like, many people have said not even the best supporting actress in her own movie, which I also agree with. But like, I, that's the, like she's like the third or fourth thing I think about when I think about that movie, acting-wise. And Hong Chao, like, I, I don't even think it was close. I would have given it to Stephanie Hsu up before her, Hong Chao, Angela Bassett. Like, I, I don't, th- I thought the nomination was a little, like, strong. It was definitely, definitely a surprise. Uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise because it was kind of leading that way. But I figured the Oscars would uh, right the ship there at the end. But eh, she won. Good for her, I guess. But I would have, if, if it was up to me. I would have given it to Kerry Condon, mm. but it never is up to me. Yeah, I even forgot about Kerry Condon. Well, that's part of why I've cooled off on award shows, because I don't necessarily agree with this win, but if we want to go through the history of the Oscars, there's so many winners that I don't agree with. Right. And so many, it's so hard to say who's deserving and who's not, but it is strange. Uh, Legacy Award? I don't know. She's been in so much shit. It's never like we thought of Jamie Lee Curtis as one of our greatest actors. She was just someone who's an icon, obviously coming from the Halloween movies, and she's a household name. But she did Freaky Friday. But this this is a common thing with the Oscars. It's like, oh, we didn't know that you could do something like this. We didn't know you could be this good, even if it's not the best. It's like Sandra Bullock in The Blind Side. That was very much a, oh, we've never respected you, now we kind of do. Here's an Oscar. (laughs) Because that's how the Academy Awards work. Well, a lot of people consider Leo's Oscar for The Revenant to be that. But, like, that year, like, his performance, I think is you could still make the argument that he was deserving. Who Do you know the other nominees? I'm, I'm not off the top of the, like, not off the top of my head, but, like, I, I think that was a very good performance. This is a chance for me to push anti-Leo propaganda. There might be one or two, like, maybe one <laughs> other you can argue. It's going to be Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> but, yeah, but he's not going to be at the bottom of that list, which I think Jamie Lee Curtis is. Oh, yeah, no, that was a weak fucking year. Michael Fassbender, Taron Egerton, not even Matt Damon, The Martian, Brian Cranston, Trumbo, Eddie Redmayne, The Danish Girl, Michael Fassbender, Steve Jobs. Yeah, that's one I would have no. That's a yeah, that's a bubble championship. (laughs) I mean, a lot of people because a lot of people think Durant was out, Curry was out. Wolf of Wall Street should have been his the year McConaughey won. Although I think that's once again though, I would. (laughs) I don't know if that's the best acting performance of that year, but I would a hundred percent give it to Leo over what McConaughey did in Dallas Buyers Club. And that's the other thing that you have to factor in with the Oscars. As happy as I am for Brendan Fraser, and I thought he was the best part of a movie that I didn't like, it's a guy in a fat suit. And the Academy just loves that. They love these transformations. As I said, it's a very good performance. But is it just hands down the best actor? Is he the best acting performance in his own group? I think that's debatable. So there are just things that you have to factor in, which are always going to play a role in who wins and who doesn't. And now Paul Mescal and Timothy Chalamet can both say, hey, we gave these really nuanced performances and we lost to white guys in a fat scene. <laughs> they now share that common thread in their careers. And both people people seem to think that they're both pretty hot. So, Yeah. Um, Up and coming. But I was happy for Brendan Fraser. I thought I would have been mad if they gave it to Austin Butler. Because if it's going to be between Austin Butler and Brendan Fraser, I would just rather Brendan Fraser get it. Yeah. So I did feel happy when I heard the B. You listen for that first, you know. Like, when they did Best Actress. Well, I saw her reaction. And, like, you're not giving Austin. Like, before you said it, like, she looked at the card and was like, gave, like, a little. Yeah, you're just going to read it, right, if it's Austin Butler? Just, yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't get that reaction. No. world doesn't feel bad for him. The world's just making fun of him. It's, people were dunking on him, which I'm like, I guess it's funny, but like cause everyone's saying like he did that accent for three months or three years and got nothing out of it. <laughs> I mean, he still had a very successful award circuit. Oh, yeah, dude. And just his uh, career is about to take off. Definitely. If it hasn't already. And that's an iconic role now. It's very similar to what Rami Malek did with Bohemian Rhapsody. I think Bohemian Rhapsody was a bigger phenomenon. Queen's a bit closer to us cultural in you know, pop culture. Elvis is going back a few more decades. But I feel like Elvis, he brought Elvis back on the mind for a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, um, I think that, yeah, for the the whole accent thing, I mean, sometimes I hear it, sometimes I don't. So He just looks into a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He sees Elvis in yeah, the reflection. It's, just that, it's that scene in Mr. Robot. Yeah. He's like seeing his father. He's seeing him. He's seeing Elvis. <laughs> if he had Elvis, uh, Elvis as the voice in his head. Yeah. <laughs> Two little Elvises on the shoulder. Do it, Austin. Kill him. Take the Oscar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't. Yeah. 
What the hell? What, Elvis, what? I knew you were a complicated man, but a murderer? Uh. I knew you were a thief. <laughs> <laughs> But the other side of it is, uh, well, not the other side of it, but something else I wanted to talk about. Like, um, so best actress. Michelle Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh. That is truly a moment that she probably never even dreamed of. When they say, oh, I never thought that this would even be possible. Uh, for somebody like, for a career like hers and a career like Kei Hoi Kwan, that truly is such an afterthought. You don't get into movies in Hong Kong working all these B-movies and martial arts and playing second fiddle to this one, that one, Jackie Chan, this star, that star, and ever imagine in 20, 30 years you're going to be standing there as the first Asian Best Actress winner. So yeah, she was... the moment for her was, it really just well, that's what I made like. me so happy. Like I, I thought Kate Blanchett should have won, but like obviously she was right there, and just to see that moment was really cool. So like that's something I don't like. Even when they played Kate Blanchett's clip, oh, I'm like, yo, Tar's comment. She, <laughs> she was nice. What was um for supporting? I noticed when they played uh, Barry Keoghan's Keegan. Wow, well, I can never say his name right. I don't know how it's pronounced. Is it Keoghan? Keoghan. 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 I feel like it's an Irish pronunciation. Probably. Yeah. Um, they did his iconic, iconic, but like his film Twitter iconic <laughs> line. It's like, oh, there goes that dream. Oh, right, right, right. And then for, I forget what clip they played, but you would think it would have been, like, I want to, I don't know. Do the laundry. The Do the laundry. Yeah. Like, that sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. And they just gave him some random line from the movie. The, yeah, some montage. He was just doing a voiceover. Yeah, it was yeah, just yeah. Some, I'm like, yeah. dude, play the line. Play the scene. I know. You would think that their team would just have a... I don't know why they don't hire kids off of Twitter. Because they're just so much better at it. Like, wh whoever runs the Letterbox social media accounts is should be putting together the Oscars. Right. Play, play the hits. It's right there for you. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, they should have their finger on the pulse of what are the best scenes, the best moments, the best lines, what are, what's really popular. Because that's how you make a better show, you know, if you want to bring in more viewers. Because they did that with, like, editing, I feel like. They showed, like, clips that displayed the editing. Like, with Elvis, it was that scene when he's standing there doing the thing and it changes to him in different outfits. But the, you know, the frame and what his placement is the exact same. Like, that's a really cool shot. Uh, everything, every there all at once. I think they did like that shot when she's going through the different verses. Like that's what I appreciated in a lot of the categories. Like they picked things that represented the skill and the art that is attributed to that category. But for acting, like some of the sometimes they did show like great scenes, and other times they just put in some throwaway sequences that doesn't really speak to how good they were in their roles. And sometimes they cut it short. Like I would rather see that than some of the other things they do because I mean that's what th we're here for is that why my friend who didn't watch any movies this year was watching no yeah but he might see an extended clip of Judd Hirsch and say hey mm. I'm gonna queue up the Fablemans yeah which came away with no wins that was another big story Fablemans Elvis and Tar no Oscars between them a lot of people predicted a good night for Elvis I think a lot of uh, a lot of most people expected everything everywhere all at once to have the most wins the best night but Austin Butler for Elvis best editing for Elvis and I think there was another one people expected them to win costume design right uh, all quiet winning a lot of technical awards right that was fun yeah obviously it won international but it also won uh, original score uh, what were some of the other technicals cinematography mm -hmm. can't disagree with that one and uh, it's not a movie that I loved but um, the cinematography go, yeah. was awesome <laughs> I don't remember production bow, design bow, bow. right there you go <laughs> it always happens every year. One movie wins all these technical awards, and film Twitter starts to go, are they going to win Best Picture? No, they're not going to win Best Picture. Did it win score? It did. Yeah, because I remember the score they played during the clip wasn't the score they played when they announced the winner. I think they played oh, the, okay. the lighter score. It's like, doo, 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 doo. winner all quiet on the Western Front. Bow, bow, <laughs> bow. <laughs> All right, guys, before we finish this episode, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsor for today's episode, and that would be Storyblocks. Calling all content creators, I want to take a quick moment of your time to introduce you to Storyblocks. Storyblocks has one of the largest libraries of royalty-free footage, templates, music, and photo assets on the internet. Plus, they have an easy-to-use video editor and unlimited downloads that allow you to easily test out different effects, clips, or tracks. 
in order to bring your creative vision to life. New content is added regularly, prioritizing in-demand keywords, so you always have what you need to stay current with trends and news. Unlike other stock companies, Storyblocks offers subscription plans for a set price. No credit systems that drain your budget or those pesky hidden fees. Storyblocks makes payments simple so you can stop worrying about your budget and take back creative control. Choose from thousands of pre-made professional templates for your favorite editing programs, including After Effects, Premiere Pro, or Apple Motion, to take your videos to the next level and speed up your creative workflow. For Adobe users, Storyblocks is now introducing Storyblocks plugin for Premiere Pro. The Storyblocks plugin helps you streamline your creative process by bringing their library directly into your editor. You can easily discover and download new content without switching between platforms, giving you more time for important things like creating. So head on over to storyblocks.com slash nerdsoup and pick a plan that is right for you. You may be interested in an individual plan, or for larger creative teams, you can sign up for their business subscription, which provides all the benefits of a Storyblocks subscription, plus additional benefits like shared folders, administrative controls, download to cloud functionality, and more. So, like we said, head on over to storyblocks.com slash nerdsoup and pick a plan that is right for you. You saw what Roger Deakins said about best cinematography, that the Batman had the best yeah. of all the movies. And he was nominated for Empire of Light. Yes, he was. That was a, not a good movie. That was fine. Thought it was going to be better, though. Yeah, it's been on HBO Max for a while. I haven't brought myself to watch it. It's it's a good... I mean... It seems like a movie that once you see the trailer, mo- you got yeah, it. But it's like you have Colin Firth, Olivia Coleman, Sam Mendes, and Roger Deakins. On paper, you're like, fuck yeah. Yeah, sometimes... Then you, then you pa- finish yeah, watching, and you're just like, yeah. They disappointed 2011 Miami. They got dirked. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's so many good people involved. That's what makes you want to watch it, especially uh, Olivia Coleman, And, of course, the god, Roger Deakins. But he did not win. That's par for the course for him. Usually he doesn't win. <laughs> um, but, like I said, I didn't love uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. I'm so glad. But there's another that one that's win, getting, like, picture. poo-pooed on by films. <laughs> poo-pooed on. Shit on my film Twitter. <laughs> um, I think it's a good movie. Very, like, solid. Technically, I think it, it's deserving of a lot of things. But as it was starting to pick up more and more wins, you know, people, you saw everyone just start shitting on it. Yeah, I think that um, it's just a movie, that type of war movie, for me, I've seen it so many times at right. this point. Not even so many times, but it felt more, and in no way am I trying to minimize the horrors of the war. It's almost a bit too glossy, where it should have been a bit bleaker. That's kind of how I like my war movies. It's either going to be Inglorious Bastards, or it's going to be a movie that I never want to watch again. I could watch All Quiet on the Western Front again, as horrifying as it is, because it's so beautifully put together. I can watch it just from a technical standpoint and say, how did they fucking film this? This must have been a nightmare to shoot. Same thing with Saving Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan, it feels like a superhero movie because there's a lot of what we stand for and the valor of being a troop. Hell yeah. But a movie like Come and See, which is also a World War II movie, I'll never watch that again because it's psychologically tormented me in ways that no movie has ever had. Right. And that's it's either got to be that or Inglorious Bastards, (laughs) where it's just a... So you'd put it like in a Hacksaw Ridge category? Yeah, and you know what really makes Hacksaw Ridge stand out more than some of these other war movies over the past few years is that the character stuff leading up to the war is so strong. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, the first half of Garfield and uh, the relationship that he has and his relationship with his father. Really good performances, too. Obviously, Garfield and Hugo Weaving. So once you get to the war, you're like, man, I really love this little guy. (laughs) He's just, uh, you know, he's right. And then he becomes a fucking super medic. It's like, yeah, man. I don't know. Pick up a gun. It's crazy out there. (laughs) Oh, my God. What? Yeah, no, I guess, right, yeah. For your own... Safety. Yeah. That motherfucker was bobbing and weaving. Do, do, do. It's, like, it's like the kid in lunch who's allergic to peanut butter, so no one can have peanut butter and jellies anymore. <laughs> yeah, he was trying to take peanut butter and jellies from everybody. He's not even allergic. He's just religious. Well, Remember that part where he put Vince Vaughn on his back and Vince Vaughn was shooting? Mm-hmm. Vince Vaughn, huh? <laughs> what a career. You know what I want to watch? Uh, the Elephant Whisperers. That seemed awesome. Best documentary short. Yeah. I it's love about that village in the, I think it was in the Middle East. Every time I do my pool documentary short and all, all the shorts, really, I just guess based off titles. <laughs> and I, I fucking nailed it this year. Oh, yeah? You got yeah. the Elephant Whispers? Nice. Um, and the other uh, animated short. It's. Uh, oh, the, right. 
What's the title of that again? Oh God, if I could remember that, I'd be a it's genius. It's like a long one, like the the yeah, the bear, the bear and the man yeah. and the person. I'm like, God, yeah, that, that's gonna win. The other thing, Fire of Love, not winning documentary was like. But also, again, I can't talk shit because I don't think I've seen all the documentaries. But Fire Love was one of my favorite movies of the year. I thought that was going to win. Oh, you're never going to beat that political documentary, especially with what's happening now. Because he is the Russian opposition mm-hmm. guy. So, he's a big deal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Volcanoes are pretty big deals, too. Mount St. Helens. What's going on with Pompeii? Well, metaphorically, he's a volcano of opposition. Yeah, I mean, we mentioned Natu Natu, one original song, original score, all quiet. Visual effects for uh, Avatar The Way of Water. Just saw that right before the podcast. I actually took 30 milligrams of edibles before that, so I am stoned out of my ass right now. You watched Avatar? Yeah, today. Well, you said you're going to go see Avatar. No, I already saw it today. Oh. Man, they really kicked in once he met Pyacon, and I was like, this movie's really just about a boy becoming buddies with a whale james cameron's fucking genius adapted screenplay women talking yeah i think most people would agree that the di- well actually no not most people but for me the dialogue is what stood out the most about that movie <laughs> and it is a lot of dialogue but i thought it was really well written and that's not easy to do when you're so reliant yeah on I mean, conversation it wasn't my favorite movie of the year but i think it was written pretty well and uh i mean just looked like shit yeah it's the most depressing looking movie ever, which didn't help the tone of the movie. It just made me mad. Well, anytime you can write a film that's two hours, two hours plus, strictly dialogue, and it turned out to be a pretty good to a lot of people think very good movie, like that's just impressive. Um, who, who else? Was, what were the other nominees? For oh, adapted quiet, screenplay, I thought I was going to win. That, that's what I picked. Is it, that got nominated, right? Yes, yeah. it did. I think that was a book. I didn't even realize Glass Onion was nominated. Good for Ryan Johnson. And uh, original screenplay, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Good night for the Daniels. Yeah, I think that's a cool thing. Like, it was one of my favorite movies of the year, but just a movie like that, as original and creative as that is to get recognition on the biggest stage, I think it's cool. Especially going up against, like, shit like Elvis and, like, your prototypical Oscar-type movies that maybe would have won in years prior or gotten more love. For that to kind of take over and get the acting awards, get the screenplay, best picture, director. I remember there was a point in the podcast where I said, hey, everything, everywhere, all at once. And it's not that you didn't think it was deserving, but you just thought it it wouldn't build that momentum because of the way they've been voting. Right. You never just know when one of these fucking movies will break out. And it's true. A lot of people didn't expect this to happen, especially so close with uh, To Parasite. I mean, in a year they have a musical biopic and a Steven Spielberg movie. <laughs> they must have been. Which if, is if like, you can visualize the Academy, yeah. they're like, how could we not pick these other two? It's like, and the Spielberg movie? It's like a love letter to... To movies? To mo- they love that. Although, I think it's a lot more than that. But like, Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, in their dumb minds? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, they were like, this is about us. <laughs> they love when movies are about them. They always give that. That's why... Moonlight winning over La La Land was the biggest whoa. Because La La Land (laughs) is literally all about Hollywood. (laughs) Well, Babylon got no love. Babylon, yeah. They were like, well, that's too negative. (laughs) Where's the La La Land? (laughs) Where are they happy? And where's Emma Stone? That's Margot Robbie. You saw Morgan Freeman hitting on Margot Robbie right in front of the entire world? Or in front of the people who still watch the Oscars? (laughs) Yeah, people were, like, pointing that out on Twitter, like, like Morgan just like me, or, like, making jokes. And... And at first, I'm like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, wait, there's a reason why Morgan Freeman hasn't been too much around lately, huh? <laughs> yeah. What was that yeah. reason again? Yeah, I think. Oh, yeah. Mm, right. Now, you're reading the jokes, it's like, well. Well, there was one. I forgot. It was Jonathan Majors and Michael B. Jordan. They're being interviewed for a junket for Creed. And the woman walks away. And they both look. <laughs> it's great. Like, when she walks by, they both look. Oh, <laughs> Those two together are pretty funny. They're awesome. Yeah, they're a good pairing. <gasps> um, and then like people are like, yeah, like they're just like us. Like, yeah, that. Yeah, that's good. That's fine. <laughs> I'm just like Michael B. Jordan. And, <laughs> yeah, sure. And uh, Jonathan Majors. Maybe not Morgan Freeman. No, not Morgan Freeman, no. Be a Majors, not a Freeman. Yeah, and I mean, everything everywhere, 
Everything Everywhere All at Once did win the most with seven Oscars. And uh, it was, uh, I guess it was a disappointing night for, well, Triangle of Sadness. What did Triangle of Sadness, did it win for anything? No, it didn't. No. It was a shame, too, with the In Memoriam. Oh, right. The lead actress, right? Yeah. And even uh, Paul Lee from Goodfellas. Paul, uh, whatever. Paul Savino. Savino, yeah. I actually saw him when we went to the Lincoln Center to watch The Godfather with the live orchestra. He mm-hmm. came out and introduced the film. Oh, nice. So it was cool. And then he sang a little bit. And then he, you know how he ended it? And now I'll turn my back. And we were all like, ah, it's not this movie. No, but it's, the, it's, the, uh, it's the other one. It's the other the one. better one. <laughs> um, it's funny. We all thought yeah, the worst one. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to see the Goodfellas with a live orchestra. <laughs> It'd just be uh, the orchestra doing Rolling Stones songs. Yes, that's I'm especially okay. a movie being nominated for Best Picture and Elite Actress not being in your memoriam. Yeah, that's Weird. a little wild. Yeah, it seems to always happen, but that's a, a, a big one, especially, <laughs> as you said, she was the lead character and one of the lead characters in a movie that was nominated for several Oscars. That always pisses me off too because once again, everything I'm so happy everything got all of these acting nominations. But it, it so it often feels like the Academy will nominate a movie and then give it nothing else. Right. But like where's it, Stephen Lang for yeah. Avatar? If but if it was like That's the best acting I've seen all year. I hate to say it, if it was an American and I guess it is an American movie because it wasn't nominated for international feature. Everything? Everywhere? No, um Triangle of Sadness. Oh, I think it might be, yeah. Which is odd, because it's a, it's a Swedish director, right? Yeah. And with Swedish characters. Doesn't it? Uh, it depends on the studio, right? I guess. But if so, but if that was an American movie with an up-and-coming American actress and she died, it would have been a bigger story, first of all. Oh, yeah. And they definitely would have had that in the in-memoriam. But I thought there were a couple of performances in that. Well, people were disappointed when the nominations were announced that the... Um, uh, they wanted best supporting for the older woman. I don't know the actress's name. In the in Triangle Sadness? Triangle Sadness. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that could have been fun. Yeah, because that was really its only nomination. That's odd. You Wouldn't know, it? I couldn't believe that Colin Farrell oh, no, has I... only been nominated once. That was yeah. his first nomination last yeah. night. Or Sunday. He's having a good year. Or had a good year. Like I said, I think every award is pretty good. Like, yeah, Brendan Fraser's speech was awesome. I tweeted that he. I just want to give him a hug. He seems like a good hug guy. Seems like, you know, come in, like, come here. It'll be like a nice little warm hug. It wasn't a, a great speech. <laughs> but just sad. No, I just respected how clean it was, too. He didn't get too over the top right. and emotional. He went up there, gave his speech, left. Who else gave a good speech that way? Kehoi Kwan, best speech yeah. of the night. Jamie Lee Curtis, worst speech. Oh. That's what made it so mm. much worse. Because I wasn't one of these people who was piling on. I'm not going to be her biggest defender. But it was so, look at me, look at me, trying to act humble. We just won an Oscar. These people, we just, no, you won the Oscar. Just get up there and say thank you, I'm awesome. I won the you Oscar. You can't even thank Stephanie, you can't even acknowledge Stephanie Shu. She doesn't have to, but I thought that the moment called for it. You have to acknowledge that you went up against somebody who was in your same movie, that you couldn't have done the cliche, we should both be up here, or doesn't even look her way. And according to Angela Bassett, she should have been up there. <laughs> <laughs> people get too worked up about that shit but dude you have to think of the significance it's not about who deserved it or is it a merit based award system what it means for your career right because you could say she would have been able to say I'm Academy Award winning Angela Bassett you Pay could me. argue she's been in just you know she's a veteran of the game too like we're giving right, fucking right. if we're giving Jamie Lee Curtis a lifetime achievement award why not Angela Bassett as well and who's to say Angela Bassett or Michelle Yeoh will ever be there again right so those are things you also have to factor in <laughs> you know people got upset for Michelle Yeoh, at Michelle Yeoh's team for sharing the article about Kate Blanchett already being a two-time winner yeah i think that's i don't think that should have any rel- like that shouldn't play anything into it it shouldn't but when you factor it in Kate Blanchett is probably going to be there again because Kate Blanchett gets good roles and she keeps getting good roles. And Michelle Yeoh may never get a role this good ever again. She may be relegated to second fiddle, third fiddle, fourth fiddle for the rest of her career. What? <laughs> how many more producers and directors are going to come along and say, we have a leading role for your 57-year-old Asian actor Michelle Yeoh? Or we have a great supporting role for 55-year-old black actress Angela Bassett? Those are more rare than the great roles that a Cate Blanchett's getting or a Meryl Streep gets yeah. or a Florence Pugh is going to get for the next 20 years. Right. That's the game. 
Sure. I yeah. So that's where it's like Kate Blanchett can already say I'm fucking Kate Blanchett. There is something to that. It's the same thing they've done to Spielberg. We're going to give you two no more. They're not they rarely give anybody more than two these it's like days. The NBA MVP. It, no, it's 100% that. It's a bit more obviously it's way more subjective. Right. Um who's gotten 3 in the last besides you know if you're a composer maybe like John Williams has 5. Yeah. Or if you're a cinematographer, they'll give you that all the time. Doesn't matter. Or Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> but I think like people, like I get like being happy for somebody else. Like you don't want to be a sore loser. But also people don't realize like there is like a competitive nature to it. And yeah, sure. There's nothing wrong with being. I'd rather someone be like, yeah, I'm fucking upset. I wanted to win. No shade to whoever did win. I'm upset. I really wanted to win. I put a lot into this role. It meant a lot to me, especially everything surrounding that movie. I think that's funnier. And I think it's better than the fucking fake person who's clapping yeah. who's thinking in their head, you know, fuck this person. I'm better than them. <laughs> and looking down on them, at least be like. No, that's fine, dude. You, We should let people be people. Allow people to be disappointed and understand why they're disappointed. As I said, there's a lot that goes into trying to carve out a Hollywood legacy. This is the pinnacle. And even though it is so, so subjective and political and people have their different agendas, if you can manage to get your hands on one, it could be a life changer for you. Or it's a way to preserve your career. As I said, now you get to market yourself when an agent sits down with a studio and they say, we've got a great role for your Academy Award nominated actress. It's like, no, Academy Award winning actress. Mm. Okay? Put that in the trailer. I get the end Angela Bassett credit. And with. What's Love better, it. the end or with? I feel like with. Because hmm. it seems like we struggled to get him to come along, but he's here. He's he's the Batman of this movie. Well, first billing is the best. Oh, yeah. Right. That's always... Well, I love Twin Peaks. That when the episode would end, it just said Kyle MacLachlan. That's my favorite. When the director doesn't put himself first. Right. Although I do always get a kick out of it with Tarantino. <laughs> Like it was like a Tarantino masterpiece production <laughs> filmed by Tarantino. Kojima does the same shit with his games. It's so funny. Well, I guess when you're good enough, it's fine. Yeah, I mean. A David O. Russell film just doesn't hit the same. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> I can't imagine he's going to be back. Well, actually, you know what? Maybe he will once he seeks refuge in another country. <laughs> All right, let's take some fan questions before we wrap this up. That's for the fan to decide. Yay! People, you call up to the show, you better be ready. That's what you're supposed to do. Sitting there arguing and you're trying to spell your name and all of this other stuff. It's not your show, it's my show. I'm giving you the, the opportunity to speak your mind. Don't call up here unless you got something to say. Uh, this one here from Movies and Weed. Fuck them awards. <laughs> Yeah. Tar, the best movie of the year, didn't get anything. What the fuck? Tar is going to be one of those. That's why if Kate Blanchett would have won, it would have been nice to say for a change, looking back in like 15 years, oh, Tar is Kate Blanchett's best performance. She won an Oscar for it. That yeah. rarely ever happens. You know, it's like Al Pacino. His best performance is Godfather 2. He didn't win. Is it her best performance? Blue Jasmine, Tar, Carol, The Aviator, she won. It's up there. Hmm. It's like Jordan's rings, which one? <laughs> How come when the whale won makeup or whatever, people are like, oh, Frazier's winning the Oscar now? How do those two correlate? Because I was just thinking about that, because obviously it's hard to win anything else before that. So, And then Cape Blanchett didn't end up winning the Oscar. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you there's see a weird correlation shit like that between all the time, yeah. when Darkest Hour won, they won Best Makeup or some shit like that. It's like that. this movie won this, so oh, now it has a better chance to win at that. Yeah, there was one statistic that was pointing towards, oh, that was pointing away from Frasier was uh, nobody's won Best Actor without being nominated for Best Picture in like yeah. four decades or some shit like that. So that's why everybody was convinced it was going to Elvis. I don't know if yeah, I don't know people this, are just making shit Oscar up. The Oscar saver metrics? <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> no, but like people who are like really in the know and know their shit, like once they w well oh, yeah. won that award, we're like, oh, Frazier's probably going to win. I'm like, how does that correlate? Well, who were the other nominees for best makeup? Was I it assume Elvis. Was it makeup and hair? All Quiet, The Batman, Black Panther, and Elvis. Mm. Yeah, maybe. But going back to my initial point with Kate Blanchett giving her best performance, at least in my opinion, it would have been nice to say because it's so rare. Like, yeah, she was acknowledged for it. And I think that it is going to be a movie where people look back. I don't think it's better than Everything Everywhere All at Once, but wow, this was truly one of the best movies of all time. It probably should have won some more things. I feel like Tar is going to have that, like, not cult following in the way of 
maybe like the Big Lebowski or shit like that, but like the character itself is going to have a cult following. <laughs> like, you remember after Whiplash? Yeah. It was just a constant meme, like J.K. Simmons' character or like being referenced. I feel like Tar, like Lydia Tar, is just going to live on as a character rather than the movie itself. Right. She's become a character almost like Rocky, where she feels real. <laughs> Build a tar statue. Build a tar statue in uh, <laughs> Berlin. <laughs> Imagine uh, they did like her protege becomes the new Tar. It's like the Creed movies, <laughs> and Tar <laughs> mentors her. <laughs> oh, it's the little the daughter. Tar was a good daddy. Um, this question here from Wadi: biggest snub, all supporting actresses for me. Yeah, yeah, most people would agree. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I guess it would have to be best supporting actress, but I think the other four are all so good. So if if I said I think Carrie Condon should have won, was she snubbed? I guess so. Yeah, I guess she was snubbed because Jamie Lee Curtis didn't win. But then I could argue, you know, Stephanie Hsu and Hong Chow were also snubbed, and Angela Bassett. So. Mm. <laughs> there was no. I, I guess that's the most egregious one for most people. But a snub for me is like um, when Michael Keaton group. didn't win. I feel like supporting actress is always super strong. Yeah, it always is. What was that one year? It was Rachel Weisz, Emma Stone. Who ended up winning? That year was fucking strong as hell. That had to no. That had to have been twenty nineteen Oscars. Twenty nineteen, yeah. Regina King, Bill Street. Oh yeah, well deserved. That's a fucking. That's and a. That's a movie that got shot shut out from every other category. Yeah. That's another movie that people will look back on and think, why wasn't this the best picture winner? Especially Green Book won that year. <laughs> Imagine Green Book winning in a year that If Beale Street Could Talk came out. Yeah, it was Regina King, Emma Stone, Rachel Weisz, Amy Adams for Weisz, and Marina de Tavira from Roma. Oh, yeah, that is a strong fucking year. Ar- yeah. Amy Adams, arguably fifth on that. Amy Adams needs to get in a fat suit. She needs to just pick better movies. <laughs> That's the other thing with Hollywood, man. It's some of these great, talented actors and actresses. They don't get roles of a lifetime that often. Dude, it's hard. Everyone's like, oh, Amy Adams, like, she'll get one eventually. Where's she been the past four years? Right. Yeah. Oh, Billy Ellergy, Woman in a Window. No, she's going to get a legacy award. It needs that to be good count. enough. It, it will count. Who I cares? don't want that. But that's the thing. It does count because you can look at- When she's, at, what, like 80 years old and no one even cares about no, it? No, she needs to find something good. Yeah. Within, like, the next 15 years, I, I think so. I would still care about her. But you always know, you know, when you were a kid and they brought out this person you never heard of or never seen any of their movies, get a legacy award. But as I said, it's so common that for these legendary actors, their best performances are rarely awarded, where it's truly that was the best performance of their career. For her, it would be, what, Doubt? Maybe. <laughs> or Arrival. She was nominated for Arrival, right? I feel like Amy Adams also isn't, She's obviously a very talented actress, but there isn't that one performance where you think she's just she's famous because she's so good. Mm. But what's her iconic iconic role? I think Sharp Objects from like it's more it's recent. It's unfortunate that it's not a movie because yeah. that was probably her best work. It's yeah. more recent, but it, I think it is some of her best acting. Yeah, and that's the other thing is that sometimes these days you could give your best performances on TV. Oh, the Master. I mean, she's been in a lot of good shit. What happened? Co- <laughs> Paul Thomas Anderson, get her back in the crew, man. Come right, on. yeah. I can't have Daniel Day anymore. Pick someone else. Did you hear that rumor that Paul Thomas Anderson's new movie is going to be about Marjorie Taylor Greene? No. <laughs> <laughs> that actually kind of fits with his lead characters. But like Just a... weirdo A prototype? Like a... No, I think it's actually going to be Marjorie Taylor Greene. But it's weird because... Why? For a long time, his next project was the 1940s jazz movie starring Denzel. Which sounds... That sound, yeah, I want that. Oh, inject that into my veins, dude. What's the... Yeah, I don't want Marjorie Taylor. I don't, I mean. <laughs> no, that one just sounds so much worse. But I think he would have, obviously, an interesting perspective on it. Yeah. What's next? The fucking... I don't know. Noah Baumbach, Lauren Bobart movie? <laughs> I, I, maybe. Yeah, get Greta Gerwig and a brunette wig. That's what you do when you're married. Help each other out. This question here from Giselle. Why are award shows trash and I'm a liberal? <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like um, sometimes like Hollywood activism or whatever you want to call it sometimes comes off very disingenuous um, to oh, the point where like yeah. even like people on like the left or like me and you would be like, what are we doing here? <laughs> 
Um, so f- I, I feel like from that perspective, it, it, it does. But I don't even think this show was that political at all. Were there any political references? Yeah, no, oh, not many. He made the joke about the editing with the Capitol footage. Oh, right, right, right. Which is like a whatever joke. Um, yeah, I don't think it was that political this year. Sometimes it's a little much, but... Yeah, I think people on the left sometimes get frustrated because it comes off as performative. Yeah, they think they're doing more than they actually are. Right. It's the same... It's the argument I'll always make about... And there's a lot of bad people who don't like that endgame moment for a lot of different reasons. But it's Disney patting themselves on the back, like, look at all these female superheroes, and it's like, you haven't had a single movie starring a female superhero. You don't deserve that. Who are you? Who do you think you are? But yeah, no, for for this show, it was pretty tame, but that was just a funny question. Somebody here asked, uh, Prime Joel versus Prime Ellie, who's winning? (laughs) Yo, I'll tell you what, part two Ellie? Yo, but like... Fucking beast. Ellie should be a fucking beast in this game, in the show right now. Yeah, I know, she's not... Dude, in the game, that's... Following that same trajectory. The sequence in the game with David, like, she's a fucking problem. And in the show, she's not useless, but Game Ellie would fucking eat her for lunch. It's more realistic. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> I've converted you. Uh, this question here from Fred. Which of the three movies that won nothing should have won at least one? Banshees, Tar, Fablements. I think the Fablements... It's tough. I don't know which one you give the Fablements. Well, it was yeah, no, everything, if, everywhere, all at once was a buzzsaw this if, yeah, year. If we're talking about, like, given the categories and what they're nominated for, then Cate Blanchett for Tar. Um, but given, like, what I think of the movie, I think the Fablements... It's Man, hard. there was some momentum building for Colin Farrell in the beginning yeah. of award season. When a lot of people, you know, The Whale was coming out, it wasn't as critically acclaimed as people thought, and then kind of came back around where Fringer, uh, Frazier became the underdog and then emerged as the favorite in the end. I love that Colin Farrell performance. He is so fucking funny in that movie. Yeah. and uh, I would have gave Banshee... Sc- like, if I, if I was the only voter, I probably would have gave it screenplay over women talking, but that was a close one. Banshee's such a good movie. Uh... I, mean, I think in a, any any other year, you would think Gleason would be a favorite, right, for supporting? I mean, obviously he had no shot given what was happening leading up to the Oscars. Yeah, and he's another one. I don't think he's ever won, but he is such a great actor. God, both of them together are so good. Yeah, everything everywhere was just, as I said, it was it was a buzzsaw. Yeah, if that movie, I wonder like, if that movie came out last year or next year, what would have filled in those gaps? Right, it probably, you know, last year was a weak year, so it would have dominated. And then this year, who would have been the favorite? Could have been spaced out, I guess, maybe... You know, not that overwhelming. I think it'd favorite. be my Spielberg director, Spielberg picture. He's never going to get another one. I'm trying to think. You don't of, think he has one more classic in his back pocket? It's just so tough, man, because he's such a legend, and I think that really does hurt him. It's the same. It's Jordan and LeBron with MVPs. You know, it was a stupid joke, but funny when he was going through. He's like, I have uh, the Mandalorian. You have to get through Spider Man. You have to get through Fable Man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I liked Spielberg's reaction. I thought he kind of nailed the response. Yeah. You don't think he has another one in his back pocket? Like a Fableman's 2? Fableman's 2? Yeah. Him making the f- movie about him making the Fableman's? <laughs> and he can make the movie about that movie? Damn. If he wants, he just has a fucking trilogy on his hands. <laughs> this question here from JJ. Which suite was better, 2020 Parasite or 2023 E-E-A-A-O? I always see that, and it takes me a second to be like, oh, that's everything everywhere all at once. It is it is much easier to spell out, not easier to say. Parasite. I was legitimately Parasite because like, it was just a moment. I was, I, was like an, I was at an Oscar party when that happened. Everyone was like, yeah, going crazy. <laughs> I think mostly because people just bet on it, but <laughs> I enjoyed it for, for the cinematic reasons. Well, I think Bong Joon-ho, for a lot of people, he's one of the best directors working today, and he has been for a while now. Mm. So it was just a validation of a career that so many people have followed and loved because of all of his big fans in the West, like Tarantino and like Scorsese. So it, it, it felt like a passing of the torch, especially with Scorsese there. I'll never forget when he quoted uh, Martin Scorsese mm-hmm. and Scorsese's reaction was like a proud father. That was just talking about is making giving me chills. This one, definitely a a surprise, but this felt like this is how it should be. You know, this was, it got all the acting nominations, won three out of the four major categories, one best picture, one best screenplay. It's like, yeah, a movie that comes out that's this well put together, this bizarre, this strange, resonates so far 
and wide with people emotionally so many different levels that yeah it should be the winner Mm -hmm. so it was just cool to see but parasite was uh it's like the giants upsetting new england the first time it's like that wasn't supposed to happen second time old eli it's cool like new life you know not household names like next year i feel like especially directing and pitcher you're gonna have you have the potential to have nolan scorsese fincher three fucking titans hey man nolan's never won i know but (laughs) i'm saying maybe this will be his fucking year oppenheimer i love that trailer so much man gets me hype villain new you know that's yeah he was nominated for the first one so this second one what a year he wasn't nominated for the first one he didn't oh, win? no, he wasn't yeah. nominated. He wasn't nominated. Was best pitcher, though, right? Yeah. yeah. That's still insane. Oh, everyone's saying that, yeah, part two is maybe where he gets that director nomination. But imagine that, like that lineup for next year. Villeneuve for Dune, Oppen- uh, Nolan for Oppenheimer, Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon, Fincher for Fincher movie. Wes Anderson, he usually gets only screenplay. I don't know. Maybe Greta Gorg. Maybe, maybe fucking... Barbie sick. I think if Barbie's great, you'll definitely see it get Oscar love, hundred percent. I think the it's the potential to market that as Barbie might win an Oscar. Yeah, because that'll be fun. And you think about it, Margot Robbie. Maybe if she's really good, then it's an acting nom. But I feel like next year's Oscars is like potential to be one that maybe mirrors this year in terms of like having a lot of a lot of movies nominated that people actually saw. You know, if you look at this year with Obviously, Avatar and Top Gun, two of the top grossing movies of all time, both being nominated for Best Picture. And then if next year, if, like, especially if Barbie gets in there, I think that's going to be insanely popular. Dune's going to be insanely popular. Scorsese always puts asses in the seats. And fucking Nolan is just automatic box office gold. So I think even more so than this year, next year can have a lot of stars and a lot of attention from just casual viewers. Well said. Okay, last question here from Yo It's Flow. Favorite moment from Everything Everywhere All at Once? It is insane that a movie with fucking Raccoon Tui <laughs> won Best Picture. Raccoon-y. <laughs> <laughs> that is a funny ass part. It is funny because it's such an old person thing to do. Like, what's the movie with the Rakakuni? <laughs> My favorite moment is when they're in the parking lot, Stephanie Shu and Michelle Yeoh, and they're having the conversation about how when I'm with you, it hurts. And they, they have that, they reconcile with each other. Just talking about that movie almost makes me want to cry. But there's just so many moments that hit me emotionally, obviously that have hit me and continue to whenever I watch it. So, But that's my favorite. I, I think it wraps up so perfectly. That's why uh, it was in my top three because it's just a, it's as close to a perfect movie as you can get. You didn't like when they're in the fight scene and the guy falls on the butt plug? <laughs> a lot of the silly things about this movie got so heavily criticized. Like, oh, it's just a poor man's Rick and Morty. Like, it's clearly influenced by that style, the bleeding heart absurdism sure, of Sure, but you know Rick how hard it is to capture that in live action? Yes, right. Yeah, it's a live action cartoon. Usually absurd. I mean, just look at any live action anime adaptation. It's like usually the craziness of animation and the absurdity that you can get away with when translated to live action comes off as goofy and silly. And people it may be talk- a little goofy and silly, it's like, but it was, it was intentional and it worked within the confines of the film itself so like yeah yeah and the people are saying it's an bombardment of sincerity it's a nice core at its worst give me a fucking break god forbid a movie has a positive ends on a positive message i like the universe when she was the actress yeah i think that was my favorite universe that was so funny when she came back to our universe and she was like i was a huge star and you weren't it you weren't anywhere there (laughs) he's like what that is a sad part he was, he was good in that, man. <laughs> he was excellent, dude. Especially when it flips where he becomes the... He's such like a... They present him as such like... Not a loser, but like... Nothing special. Right. And you realize he is special. In his own way. Yeah. All right, guys. That does it for this podcast, this episode of the Nerd Suit Podcast. All you guys out there listening, thank you. Know that you are also special. For Aaron the Nerd Suit Monkey, I am Bo Oliver. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, do all that good stuff, and we will see you here back next week talking i don't know who knows what we're talking about we need some news house of the dragon drop something succession coming soon you see tilu have better ratings than hot d they should fight <laughs> that'd be great for us crossover are you fucking kidding me wow that was probably our best review yet hey guys aaron the nerd suit monkey here with a brief shameless plug before we end the video 
Do you ever feel like you don't have an adequate amount of nerd soup in your life? Like you're going to bed hungry and yearning for the nonsensical yet entertaining nutrients our podcasts provide? Well, we've come up with the perfect solution. The Nerd Soup Fan Question Podcast, exclusively available to our Patreon supporters. You can sign up now by visiting patreon.com slash nerdsoup, and for the price of only $1 per month, you'll receive exclusive access to our weekly podcast, where we answer your questions that don't make it to the main show. And while you're there, you can check out the other rewards we offer to our patrons, like stickers, mugs, t-shirts, behind-the-scenes footage, and appearing in the credits at the end of our videos. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. Roll the names of the nerds who make nerd soup possible. The reason why the crypto crash didn't send our lives spiraling down a black hole of no return. Alright, I'll stop talking so you can listen to this jazzy-ass music while checking if Bo spelt your name wrong in the credits.